G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Lamentations. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So we're into session four. We, we're going to try and get through uh, chapter three, verse 55, down to chapter four, verse 22. We're going to try and get through it. Let's see how we go. So we're still in this area where we're having uh, Jeremiah's lamentation, his prayer. He's continuing on. It, was, it started in chapter three, verse one. It's going to get it. Verse 66, we're going to kick off in verse 55, where we see the comfort of Jeremiah. And we, here again, verse 55 begins with a Hebrew letter, Kof. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for I called, which is karate. I called upon your name, O Jehovah, out of the lowest dungeon. This probably refers to the time towards the end of Nebuchadnezzar's siege. Remember when we did back in Jeremiah uh, 38, uh, when he was, remember, he was lowered into a muddy cistern and left there to die. This is probably where this prayer has come from. And then verse 56 now begins with the letter Kof. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for my voice, which is Koli. You heard my voice. Hide not your ear at my hearing, at my cry. Well, it says here, um, at my breathing. Well, it's rather at my sighing. You know, literally at my relieving myself. Oh, you know, wow. God, just please hear me. Now, at my cry, it's a loud, earnest cry. So he is pretty involved in prayer. Verse 57 now begins with the Hebrew letter Koth again. First letter of the Hebrew term for you drew near, Karavta. You drew near in the day that I called upon you. You said, fear not. Jeremiah remembered that his rescue came as a result of his prayers. Now, as was, remember, I know you might remember, but right back in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 8, God says to him, be not afraid because of them, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says Jehovah. So uh, here, uh, his enemies did not succeed, Jeremiah's enemies did not succeed in killing him. Instead, God drew near to him, reminding him not to fear. Don't fear, Jeremiah, I'm in control. You will not get hurt. So th these are some reflections upon Jeremiah's dungeon experiences. And we learn that Jeremiah's rescue by Ebek Milak came as a result of his personal prayer life. But again, here, Jeremiah is, is simply using his own personal experiences to reflect the experience of the nation. So when Jeremiah prayed and pleaded, God rescued him from his experiences. When the nation prays and pleads, God will also deliver them from their experiences. So what we're seeing here is if the nation, well, if the nation had prayed, uh, they could have been delivered. God will do for the nation collectively what he did for Jeremiah individually. Jeremiah was a living example to Judah of God's loyal love and faithfulness. And verse 8 begins with the Hebrew letter Resh, the first letter of the, of the Hebrew term for you have pleaded, Ravta. O Lord, you have pleaded the causes of my soul. You have redeemed my life. Uh, in, in actual fact, here where it says, Lord, that's the that's the word Adonai. Adonai, Adonai pleased it, pleaded the causes of Jeremiah's soul, meaning that, that, that he set out to defend the prophet and he also physically redeemed Jeremiah. So the Lord has not only spoken, where he says, don't fear, but he's also acted. God physically redeemed Jeremiah from his enemies that he described back in, in verses 52 to 55. Verse 59 begins with the Hebrew letter resh. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for you have seen. Reta. O Jehovah, you have seen my wrong. Judge you my cause. Now, um, here I, I use the ISV uh, version of the Bible, the, the American Standard Version, 1901. Uh, and this, this version gives the impression that Jeremiah pointed uh, Jehovah to the wrong he himself had done. But uh, it's, it is better to translate the verse here as, and, and I think the ESV translates it this way, you have seen the wrong done to me. Jeremiah claimed sinlessness here in regard to this situation, yet he still surrendered himself to God's judgment. 
Judge you my cause, he says. Do me justice, God. Right my wrongs and save me from my enemies as, as you've done before. That's virtually what he's saying here. In verse 60, begins with the letter, Hebrew letter Resh. First letter of the Hebrew term for you have seen, right, ha. Uh, you have seen all their vengeance and all their devices against me. Jeremiah reminded God of the vengeance and devices his enemies had brought against him. The, the actual, uh, the Aramaic Targum renders the verse as all their vengeance has been revealed before you, all their evil plans against me. So their vengeance here refers to the vengeful acts committed by Jeremiah's enemies to get even with him, you know, well, to repay him for his evil, what they thought was evil. They were committed no evil against him. He was simply God's spokesperson prophesying on behalf of God. That's all he was doing. Uh, there was no evil involved in that, but they saw it as being evil because he said, listen, you know, you've got to just, you know, uh, um, um, surrender to the Babylonians. So uh, Jeremiah summarizes here God's answer to his prayers. And uh, this is God's defense of Jeremiah. So what happened to Jeremiah literally in the dungeon will one day place one day take place on the national level, which, which we, we saw. Now, verse 61 begins with the Hebrew letter Shin, S-H-I-N, first of the Hebrew term, for you have heard Shemata. Uh, here we go. In, verse, in verses 61 to 63, the theme of these verses is God's observation of the sins of the enemy. You have heard their reproach, O Jehovah, and all their devices against me. Now, verse 1 is very similar in meaning to verse 60, which we just looked at. In verse 60, God has seen what the enemies of Jeremiah have done. And in verse 61, he has heard their insults. So Jeremiah, uh, not a, well, well, Jeremiah not only saw as they appeared in their actions, well, God actually, but heard them as they were expressed by their words. So, so what Jehovah God has heard are the insults and the scorn of Jeremiah's enemies. So these are words or expressions shouted out to insult Jeremiah. You foolish old man, you know, all, all that sort of stuff, which we saw back, actually back in, in the book of Jeremiah. And verse 62 begins with the letter Shin again, same thing as the last one. First of the Hebrew term for the lips, which is Sifti. Um, it says, verse 62, the lips of those that rose up against me and their device against me all the day. Now, uh, their device here, uh, Hegionam, uh, is, is a different Hebrew word to pr the previous verse. Here it means whispering, all right? It means whispering. A, bad, a better translation here uh, would be the lips of those that rose up against me and their whispering are against me all the day. Yeah, it, it just goes to show you that we... You know, we can't take the fact that everywhere it says, oh, device, 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 it's the same Greek, uh, Hebrew word <laughs> because they can they can differ. So you just have a, if you can, just check the Hebrew words, see that they're not, not different. Um, so what we see here, this word device is different to the previous verse's device. So what we see here, what Jehovah has heard are the taunts of Jeremiah's enemies. So these are words or expressions shouted out to insult Jeremiah. Now, if one were to take the, the, the translation of the ASV, which is, which is what I, I'm using here, then the meaning of the verse is that the prophet asked God to judge both the taunts, which came from the lips, and the deeds, the devices of his enemies. That, that's what Jeremiah is actually asking. He's asking God to judge judge their insults against me and, and judge all their plans against me, O oh God. Now, verse 63, we have Shin again. Um, remember when we, I know it was a long time again when we started this. Remember, it, it's a, it's a book, 22, 22 um, letters in the, in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, this ver this chapter here, which has 66 verses, uh, each block of three verses has the same um, start, the, the same letter. Here again, we had the letter Shin, had it previously, 
uh, first sort of the Hebrew term for their sitting down, which is shivtam. Behold you, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their song. So they're sitting down and they're rising up is a pretty um, comprehensive expression for all a man's occupations, the totality of their activities. Whatever they're doing, God, uh, you know, they're rising up. I'm, I'm the one they're, they're shouting out against. Whatever they're doing every day, it's, it's about me, me, me. Yeah, so Jeremiah now asked God to behold the sitting down and the rising up of his enemies. Why? Because he had become their song, which meant that they had made fun of him. And this maltreatment required the judgment of God, according to Jeremiah. Rem remember, <laughs> poor Jeremiah, he was constantly the focus of their ridicules and the subject of their taunting songs. You know, who'd want to be a prophet? My gosh, poor Jeremiah. You know, go to a people. They're not going to listen to you, but I want you to go to them anyway. And they're going to taunt you with all these songs. Oh, thank you, God. I'll, I'll certainly do that. Yeah. Now, verse 64, we now have a, uh, this is the last three verses, 64, 65, 66. So now we have the Hebrew letter Tav, T-I-V. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for you will render, which is Tashiv. Yeah. Verses 64 to 66 brings us now to the end of chapter 3. And Jeremiah here expresses his certainty that God will bring judgment and destroy his enemies. 64, you will render unto them a recompense, O Jehovah, according to the work of their hands. What they sow, Lord, let them reap. What's a recompense? Well, a recompense is simply a punishment or reward based upon what they deserve. <laughs> In this instance, it's a punishment, not a reward. According to the work of their hands, it's based upon what they did to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's pleas for God to consider the wrong that had been done to him now turned into a declaration of conviction. The prophet affirmed that God would indeed render judgment upon his enemies. 65 begins with the Hebrew letter have uh, first uh, first letter of the Hebrew term for you will give Titan, I think it is. You will give them hardness of heart, your curse unto them. Yeah. Hebrew term for hardness is meginat. It's it's what is called a, a hapax legom, legomenon, uh, which, which simply means we don't find it anywhere else in scripture. And it 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 may this heart this word for hardness here, it may simply refer to the covering of the heart. However, Again, the term that the translators of the ASV, which, which I'm using, use hardness, and that fits the context very well in what we're going to see. Now, remember, for 40 years, for 40 years, Jeremiah was taken as a young man, right? And for 40 years, the prophet had suffered at the hands of his enemies. And just as God hardened Pharaoh's heart before judging him, what we see, what we're going to see is that he would harden the heart or the hearts of Jeremiah's enemies. And verse six, uh, 66, again, Hebrew letter Tav, first letter of the Hebrew term for you will pursue Tirdof. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of Jehovah. So in the grand finale of his judgment, Jehovah would pursue Jeremiah's enemies in anger and destroy them from under the heavens. You know, remember, the leaders responsible for rejecting and persecuting Jeremiah were punished by Babylon. The parallel uh, to Jerusalem was obvious because she too, Jerusalem, was also persecuted by her enemies. Go back into chapter 3 of, of uh, Lamentation, chapter 3, 46 to 47, and you see it there. But she could be confident also that God would vindicate her before her enemies if she would turn to him, just like Jeremiah turned to him. But alas, they didn't. Now, concluding chapter 3. Lamentations 3 highlights the suffering of one individual, Jeremiah, 
against the backdrop of the nation's afflictions. The chapter shows that bemoaning one's suffering is permitted, you know, yet the focus has to be on the source of all hope, which is Jehovah. Okay, so you're going through suffering, but the but the source of hope to come out of that suffering or to bring me through the suffering is Jehovah. Also, what we what do, what do we see in this chapter three? Well, the regeneration of one's uh, relationship with God is possible when the sinner recognizes his responsibility and repents of his wrongdoing, and God accepts him, forgives him. Uh, another important point of this chapter is that Jeremiah called for vengeance against Judah's foes as much as he asked God to vindicate him personally. Jeremiah expressed unwavering confidence in the victory of righteousness and in the assurance that his pain and suffering would one day be redeemed. He was right. Okay, coming into chapter 4. And chapter 4 describes the siege of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. It contains the same number of verses as the first and second chapters, which is only 22 verses. But each verse encompasses only two lines instead of three. The city of Jerusalem is described now as being unable to support its starving population any longer. Why? Uh, because, because, you know, they're on the siege. And both its fall and the exile of its citizens are imminent. It's, it's going to happen. The lament of chapter 4 differs from the previous chapters in that it focuses more upon the specific classes of leaders as well as of the children, mothers, and Nazarites. Now, this focus on specific groups that will now provide a, an overview of the range of human tragedy. Another significant uh, theme of Lamentations 4 is the absence of God-centered prayers. Hmm. We're going to look at it in five parts, okay? First up, the conditions during the siege, uh, verses 1 to 10, the cause of judgment, verses 11 to 16, the fall of hope, in verses 17 to 20, and the judgment upon Edom, in verses 21 to 22, and then conclusion. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll number all these as we go through. Okay. So first up, we're going to look at verses 1 to 10, the conditions during the siege. The main point of this lamentation is the description of the siege of Jerusalem. First, first subdivision or division is the conditions during the siege, verses 1 to 10 of chapter 4. And we see the effect upon the people in verses 1 to 3. How has the gold become dim? How has the most pure gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out at the head of every street. Okay, let's just look at verse 1 first. Verse 1 begins with the Hebrew letter Aleph. First letter, first letter of the Hebrew term for how. H-ha. So in verse 1, uh, Jeremiah used Two different words or two different expressions for gold here. So again, see what we we're saying before. Uh, gold is not, in English, gold is gold. But here we have two different words for gold. Now, so the first term is zakav, zakav gold. Second expression is haketem hatov, pure gold. Now, so we, we, we're looking here, um, uh, verse one. So regardless of its grade of purity, what Jeremiah is saying here, Jerusalem's gold has piled. It's become dim, covered. Also, we see that the stones of the sanctuary had been poured out at the head of every street. Now, yeah, these precious stones within the temple itself, they also contain uh, gold as well in, uh, what do you call it, when they stick them into it, uh, there was so much gold that these precious stones with the gold were seen uh, now as being almost useless. Even the facade of the building was adorned with this precious metal. Now remember, uh, verse 1 is written here uh, with it in the background of the destruction of the temple. Because remember, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is just outside. He's coming in. So these stones... And the gold 
they now become figurative of the people in general, which we're going to see when we get to verse 2. So the point of verse 1 here is that gold has pretty much become valueless when there was nothing left to purchase. No matter how much gold you had, if there's nothing to buy it, what's the point? No good. All the food was gone by this time. It didn't matter how much gold or wealth a person possessed, it was useless because all the food was now gone. Remember, they were under siege. Verse 2 begins with the Hebrew letter bet, first under the Hebrew term for sons, benai, b-n-e-b-n-e-i, the precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? The work of the hands of the potter. So, the precious sons of Zion are near comparable to fine gold. In the past, Jerusalem's citizens were precious and they were compared to fine gold. And this word for gold, which we see here in verse 2, is different from the Hebrew word used in verse 1. So this shows here that the gold referred to in verse 1 was actually figurative of the Jewish population of Jerusalem. Back in verse 1, the gold had become dim and precious jewels had become discarded as waste. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? So, once the citizens of Jerusalem were valued as gold, now they're regarded as clay pottery. All, all their value had gone. All their value had gone. Then we have in verse 3, we see the Hebrew, it starts with the Hebrew letter Gimel. Gimel is the first letter of the Hebrew term for even, which is gam. Here it is, verse 3. Even the jackals draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. Yeah. Ostriches were famous for their cruelty to their young. Uh, how do we know that? Well, Job tells us that. Job 39, verses 13 to 16. Uh, verse 16 says this in Job, Job 39. This is the ostrich. She deals hardly with her young ones as if they're not hers. Uh, the, 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 the mother didn't really care about the young ones. When we see jackals, see here they're being compared to jackals. No, this is two animals, jackals and ostriches. Okay. Although the jackals were known for their fierceness, they actually do provide milk for their young ones. What's the point of verse three? Well, what Jeremiah is saying here is that the mothers of Jerusalem, known in the past for their compassion and love for their offspring, had become indifferent to their young. The children of Jerusalem received worse treatment than the baby jackals and baby ostriches did. So the effect upon the whole, upon the people of the city of Jerusalem was that they became cruel. They didn't even take care of their own young ones. They didn't even take care of their own flesh and blood. That's, that's how they were affected. In verses 4 to 10, we see the effects of the famine. In verses 1 to 10, Jeremiah deals with the conditions during the fam during the siege. Uh, and then in verses 1 to 3, he dealt with the effects upon the people. The, the famine affected the character and the actions of people. Verse 4 begins with the Hebrew letter Dalet, D-A-L-E-T. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for cleaves which is devak, the tongue, verse 4, the tongue of the sucking child cleaves to the roof, roof of his mouth for a thirst. The young children ask bread, and no man breaks it onto them. So this verse describes the physical experience of thirst. It's the dryness of the tongue within a parched mouth. Jerusalem's starving mothers were unable to produce enough milk to feed their infants, and there was no water in the city. Little children uh, begged their parents for food, but they were sent away hungry. There was no food. There may have been bread available, 
but the adults refuse to share it with their children or with the children. So the entire scene here serves as an illustration of the truth that was spelled out, which we saw back in verse 3, namely that the famine had hardened the people of Judah. I've never been in a famine, so I don't know what my reaction would be. Now, verse 5 begins with the Hebrew letter hey. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for they that did feed. It's ha oklim. So this is the effects of the famine upon the upper classes now. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. Now this is a contrast here between the past and the present. Now the Hebrew term here for delicately, it, it comes from the noun uh, madan, uh, which means a dainty food, which is used in Genesis 49 verse 20. Genesis 49 verse 20, and this word is used alongside the word king. So what it's saying to us here is that those who once ate gourmet foods fit for a king, you know, all the specialties and all the wonderful stuff, you know, oh, lobster, all that sort of stuff, not for Jews, but for me, were now roaming the streets seeking scraps of anything that was remotely edible. So those who were raised wearing scarlet, which was, you know, like scarlet, purple, royal attire, um, it, it, it's made from um, uh, it, it's, it's silkworms. Silkworms, the color is, is sort of ready. With these two comparisons, the, this, this verse here simply illustrates a contrast between life in Jerusalem before the siege and life after the siege. So that's what we're really seeing here. Um, you know, uh, verse six, oh, oh, going back to, you know, they even, they were even happy to, you know, sit up on the dung hills just in case as they go through, they might find something to eat. But, you know, it, it just, it was so bad. In verse six uh, begins with the Hebrew letter Vav. Uh, it's the her first letter of the Hebrew term for and is greater which is vi yigdal, um, verse 6, for the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment and no hands were laid upon her. Now, he brings Sodom in here. Well, hmm. So here we see this is the cause of the judgment of famine. Now, looking back into, into history, the sins of Sodom brought about its destruction. The sinfulness of God's people, which we're seeing here, superseded the sins of Sodom. Of Sodom. Not Sodom, Sodom, but Sodom. The sins of Jerusalem brought about her destruction. Only this time it came by famine as well as by military conquest. It says that was overthrown as in a moment and no hands were laid upon her. Remember, Sodom suffered sudden destruction and there was no prolonged agony. It was fire and brimstone from heaven. Done. Done and dusted. So in that sense, Sodom was better off than Jerusalem. The iniquity of Jerusalem actually caused her to die a very slow, agonizing death. According to verse 6, Jeremiah surmises that the sins of Jerusalem were greater than the sins of Sodom. Of Sodom. Great, remember, this is for you and I as well, greater light brings greater judgment. Unlike Sodom that was destroyed quickly and suddenly with no prolonged agony, Jerusalem died in prolonged agony. You know, verse 7 begins with the Hebrew letter Zayin. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for were purer, Zaku, her nobles were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was as of sapphire. The Hebrew word used for nobles is used elsewhere in the Old Testament uh, in reference to Nazarites, which means 
uh, one who is consecrated or, or devoted, uh, and it generally refers to nobility. You can check it out in, in Genesis 49, verse 26. Genesis 49, verse 26. So Jeremiah here may actually be referring to the Nazarites, although the word itself can refer to the upper classes of the nobility. So, so what we see here is that these individuals took an oath to yield themselves completely to God, and that's the Nazarite vow, which you find down in, in Numbers ch chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. He says they were purer than snow, whiter than milk, etc., etc. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was as of sapphire. The point of this comparison was not the color, but it was the luminosity. They what same as the gold. They glittered in the past, but now that that glitter is no more. It's gone. No more glitter. They too have become dull. You know, verse 8 begins with the, uh, the Hebrew letter Chet. First letter of the Hebrew term for is blacker, which is Shashak. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They're not known in the streets. Their skin cleaves to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a stick. So rather than having that luminous appearance that they had in the past, they now have a very blackened appearance. Now, um, malnutrition and starvation wreaks havoc on the skin of an individual. It is not uncommon uh, for things like the earlobes and, and the fingertips to turn dark blue or almost black uh, due to a, a lack of nutrients and poor circulation. Uh, see it in diabetics. The fact that their skin is hanging from their bones shows the extremity of their hunger. They no longer go around wearing rubies and sapphires. More than likely, you couldn't fit it on their hands anyway because they're so skinny. And verse 9 begins with the letter het, first under the Hebrew term for beta, which is tovim. They that are slain with the sword are better than they that are slain with hunger. For these pine away, stricken through, for want of the fruits of the field. So what we see here is that the situation was so bad that Jeremiah says in this verse that it is better to die a very quick death by the sword than to die the slow death of starvation. It's painful and it's agonizingly long. And then verse 10 begins with the Hebrew letter Yod, it's the first letter of the Hebrew term for the hands, which is the eye. The hands of the pitiful women have boiled their own children. They were their food in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Uh, now, pitiful here can actually be translated, and actually in some, some uh, versions, it, it, it is compassionate. Uh, uh, the hands of the compassionate woman. Uh, now, it became clear that mothers actually resorted to eating their own children. Uh, now, these were actions which would have been, uh, which would appear to be opposite to their nature. Uh, the children were not treated very well. Uh, this was in the time of this famine. Not only was whatever food was available withheld from them, but the children were eaten as well by their mothers. Uh, right back in chapter 2, verse 20, they were accused, uh, in Lamentations, they were accused of eating the bodies of the children that they loved. Now, what we see here is that they're boiling them to eat. So this is something that jackals and ostriches of verse 3 do not do to their young. They don't eat their young. Now in verses 11 to 16, we see the cause of the judgment. So 1 to 10, siege described. 11 to 16 now deals with the specific causes of the judgment. Uh, verse 11 begins with the Hebrew letter kaf, K-A-P-H. First letter of the Hebrew term for has accomplished, which is kila, K-I-L-A. Jehovah has accomplished his wrath. 
He has poured out his fierce anger and he has kindled a fire in Zion which has devoured the foundations thereof. Now the war with Babylon was nearing its end and Jeremiah concluded that Judah and Jerusalem had suffered God's wrath. It was Jehovah who kindled the fire in Zion that destroyed the city to its very foundation. Uh, and we see that in, in, in the second part of verse 11 here. The events described in verses 1 to 10, along with the destruction of Jerusalem, were the culmination of God's anger toward the sin of his people. It was God who did this. Now, verse 12 begins with the letter Lamed. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for not. N-O-T. And the word is lo. The kings of the earth believed not, neither all the inhabitants of the world. The adversary and the enemy would enter into the gates of Jerusalem. Remember, previous attempts by the Assyrians failed with great devastation of their army. Remember, there's 185,000 killed in, in, in one night. So the destruction of the city must have come as a huge surprise. There was a false confidence as a result on the part of the people. They simply believed uh, that Jehovah would save them from their enemies. Remember uh, in, in Jeremiah, you know, we have the temple, the temple, uh, that's, that's going to protect us. No one in the world uh, believed that what the Assyrians were unable to do, that the Babylonians could accomplish. They had suffered at the hands of the Assyrians they suffered much more at the hands of the Babylonians when Nebuchadnezzar's army breached the gates of Jerusalem and the city fell. Indeed, the false confidence of the people collapsed for the adversary did enter into the gates of Jerusalem. And in verse 13, it begins with the Hebrew letter Mem. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for because of the sins. It's Makatot. It is because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. Now, this is not the first time that Jeremiah places the blame for the destruction of Jerusalem upon the false prophets and priests. We, we find this back in Jeremiah 6, verses 13 to 15, and Jeremiah 23, 11 to 12. And uh, Jeremiah 26, 7 to 9. So what we see here is that the blame is clearly with the leadership. And remember, uh, the Jews had this, um, um, this concept that, you know, whatever our leaders do, well, we'll follow our leaders because our leaders are our leaders. Uh, and remember, that's exactly what we saw in the Gospels when the leaders, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees rejected Jesus uh, saying he was demon possessed well the population followed as well saying he was demon possessed so I got a leadership complex okay now verse 14 begins with the letter nun n-u-n it's a her first letter of the Hebrew term for they wander which is now now no n-a-u they wander as blind men in the streets they're polluted with blood so that men cannot touch their garments now this verse describes the fate of the false prophets and priests. The false prophets and unfaithful priests of the previous verse were wandering blindly through the streets. They were polluted with blood, and, and polluted with blood rendered them ceremonially unclean. So no one desired to touch even their garments. And they wanted to touch their garments because if they did that, they too would be rendered ceremonially unclean. So consequently, uh, the fate of the false prophets and unfaithful priests was that they were no longer believed and were treated now as outcasts. A bit late now, though. Verse 15 begins with the Hebrew letter Samek. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for depart ye, jisuru. Depart ye, they cried unto them, unclean. Depart, depart, touch not. 
When they fled away and wandered, men said among the nations, they shall no more sojourn here. So the entire picture here is that these prophets and priests were treated as if they were actual lepers. They cried out, unclean, unclean, do not touch. Now, when these false prophets and, and priests could no longer live among their own Jewish people, they began to live among the Gentiles. However, their reputation preceded them, and the Gentiles didn't like them either. So the fate of the false priests and prophets was twofold. First, uh, they were treated as lepers by Jews in accordance with Leviticus 13, 45 to 46. And second, when they tried to find refuge among the Gentiles, their reputation of being bad luck preceded them. And so they were for forced to move on and they never received any rest of settlement. The 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is, is Ayin, and the next verse should begin with this letter. However, uh, we saw a similar thing back in chapters 2 and 3 uh, of Lamentations, where we have a reversal of letters in the next passages. So verse six, 16 here actually begins with the letter Hay, P-E-Y. First sort of the Hebrew term for anger, penai, or penai. Uh, this term actually means face. Uh, Hebrew literally reads as the face of Jehovah. Okay, The anger of Jehovah or the face of Jehovah had scattered them. He will no more regard them. They respected, they respected not the person of the priests. They favored not the elders. So... So Jehovah turned his face away from the false prophets and, and unfaithful priests. Uh, and by, by doing that, he actually scattered them, meaning that his wrath caused their dispersion. And in, 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 in second line 16b, it's, see there the pronoun they, and that again refers to the false prophets and the unfaithful priests. These men uh, did not respect the believing priests and elders who refused to lead the people astray. They didn't believe them. They said, no, 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 they're telling you false things. We're the true prophets. But they weren't. They were proved to be the false prophets. Okay, so in verses 17 to 20, we're going to see the, the fall of hope. So we're going to see here in these verses that uh, we're going to see another reason for the fall of Jerusalem and that is the futility of foreign alliances. When the people of, of Judah recognize this futility, their hope fell away. Verse 17 begins with the Hebrew letter Ayin, first letter of the Hebrew term for yet, which is Adonai. Our eyes do yet fail in looking for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save. <clears throat> So what we see here is that uh, instead of relying upon God for protection against the Babylonians, Jerusalem had placed uh, her hope in the Egyptians. She sent uh, ambassadors down there to seek help. The prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel all cautioned them against trusting that nation. And we see that in, in Isaiah 36, 6, uh, Jeremiah 37, 6 to 10 and Ezekiel 29 6 to 7. However, the people did not want to heed the, the prophets' warnings. They preferred their false prophets. So with the destruction of Jerusalem at hand, they finally recognized that they had been watching for a nation that could not save them. They were watching and waiting for Egypt to come deliver, but Egypt couldn't save them. Verse 18 begins with the letter Zadi. First letter of the Hebrew term for they hunt, Zadu, they hunt our steps. So we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled, for our end is come. So the verse here describes the fate of those Jews who survived the Babylonian conquest. After the fall of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar sent out soldiers to track down anyone who tried to avoid the exile. And those in hiding could sense that they would soon be found and executed. We see that in the, in the 
second half of verse 18 there. Verse 19 begins with the letter Kof, P-H, first letter of the Hebrew term for swifter, which is Kalim. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of the heavens. They chased us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. So the survivors in hiding realized that their pursuers were swifter than the eagles of the heavens. No mountain was high enough to escape them. And even in the wilderness, meaning the desert territory, they would lie in wait until the escapees could be caught. And once these Jews were found, they were pursued and then entrapped. Verse 20 begins with the Hebrew letter resh, first letter of the Hebrew term for breath, the ruach. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of Jehovah, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Now, word anointed here is the Hebrew word uh, Yeshua or Messiah. Uh, in this case, it refers to the Lord's anointed uh, in the kingship of Zedekiah. It's not referring to the Messiah here. It's just referring to the Lord's anointed, who is Zedekiah, the last king of, of Judah. Now, verse 20 uh, should not be taken as some sort of a tribute to Zedekiah. Rather, it simply refers to his kingship as the Lord's anointed. Uh, being king, he still had the office of the Lord's anointed, just as remember Saul uh, ha had it also, although they were both wicked men. Uh, he goes on to say, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nation. Now, so remember, um, Zedekiah was of the line of, of King David. So their hope, uh, while Zedekiah is on the throne, their hope was that as long as a king of the house of David sat upon David's throne, there was some hope of sustaining a national identity. But now with Zedekiah being taken captive, all hope was now lost. We see the judgment upon Edom in the last two verses of chapter 4. Ah. Verse 21 begins with the Hebrew letter Shin, the first letter of the Hebrew term for rejoice. Sisi. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom that dwells in the land of Uz. The cup shall pass through unto you also. You shall be drunken and shall make yourself naked. So what we see here is a call now went out to the daughter of Edom, meaning the general population of this nation, to rejoice and be glad. Now, nowadays, Edom is in the area of southern Jordan. But Jeremiah here describes the nation as dwelling in the land of Uz which was the homeland of Job. You see that in Job chapter 1, verse 1. So the command for Edom to rejoice is to be taken sarcastically here with, with mockery because Edom's rejoicing over Judah's fall will be very short-lived. The Edomites are actually united with Babylon in 587 BC to support the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, you can see that in Jeremiah 49, verses 7 to 2. Oh, hang on. That's the next next one. Yeah. So the, the, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 49, 70, 70, 22. So the cup of God's wrath would now one day be passed to this nation also. Uh, and, and we see that in Ezekiel 25, verse 14. So the initial judgment against Edom was administ administered by the Babylonian conquerors. Yet the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is going to come in the tribulation as we're going to see coming up. Verse 22 begins with the Hebrew letter Tav. It's the first letter of the Hebrew term for is accomplished, Tam, as in Tim Tam. The punishment of your iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry you away into captivity. He will visit your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will uncover your sins. Point of verse 22 is that the guilt of Israel will eventually end when the wrath of God of when the wrath of God against Israel is finally spent, the people of Jerusalem could look forward to a restoration. Jeremiah declared that the punishment for their iniquity was accomplished and that they would never be exiled again. This is Jeremiah in Jeremiah's day saying this, okay? But hello, in AD 70. Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and the 2,000-year diaspora of the Jewish people began. So 
Therefore, what we see here is that verse 22 cannot refer to the Babylonian destruction of the city, but it must be looking toward the ultimate future and the final restoration of Israel in preparation for the Messianic kingdom. The sin of Israel will eventually be redeemed and then the wrath of Jehovah will fall on Edom. He will visit the inequity of Edom's people and uncover their sins. Now, Jeremiah would have known about this prophecy regarding Edom from the book of Obadiah. Obadiah verses 5 to 9 and Obadiah verses 17 to 21 show us this. A couple of other, um, other references here to the destruction of this nation of Edom include Isaiah 34, 1 to 17, Jeremiah 49, 7 to 22, Ezekiel 25, 12 to 14, and 35, 6 to 9, and, and verse 15, Joel 3, 19, and Amos chapter 1, verses 11 to 12. During the Messianic kingdom, Edom is going to be a land of burning brimstone, and it's going to be the habitation of of demons. You can check it out in, in those passages we just looked at there. Okay, wrapping it up. Chapter 4 laments the siege of Jerusalem and the people's intense suffering. Even the upper classes were reduced to destitution and starvation. Once compassionate mothers turned cruel toward their children who cried in vain for food and water, but there was none. In comparison to the disaster that befell Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was merciful because a swift death is preferable to the slow agony of starvation, which drove mothers to actually consume their own children. Judah's false prophets and unfaithful priests who had led the people into idolatry were to blame for the disaster. However, the tide turned. And the enemy now exhibited no pity for these impostors. People who attempted to flee the Babylonian captivity were pursued and apprehended. The nation's only hope, who was King Zedekiah, he also fled at Babylon through a breach in the wall, but he was caught. The final punishment and disgrace came when Edom was called to rejoice over Judah's fate. But a prophecy was made that the enemy nation would also be forced to drink from the cup of God's wrath. Now, unlike the previous chapters, uh, Lamentation 4 does not end with a prayer to God, but with the promise that Jerusalem will receive forgiveness and restoration in preparation for the Messianic kingdom. And that is a lot for today. Study hard, grow strong. Thank you for coming along.